Okay, hi everybody. So I want to talk about um, my kind of personal opinions about the GP GPU developer experience. Um, I feel like we don't talk about developer experience enough um, when we talk about GP GPU. Um, we tend to focus more on um, performance issues and distributed computing and stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> I know a lot of the audience here is from an academic background. Uh, and so folks who um, focus on GP, GPU in, in academia may not have fully realized um, how incredibly popular GP, GPU has become in the last few years. And to give you a sense, um, this is the downloads for a CUDA toolkit um, on just one, from just one source, which is from the Anaconda Python repository. And uh, as you can see, um, 11.3 has 1.1 million downloads, 11.4, 1.1 million downloads, 11.1, 1 million downloads. We've got to a point now where um, literally over a million people are downloading CUDA. Um, so what are all these people doing? Um, they are not writing CUDA kernels. Um, if you look at the uh, Kaggle developer survey, um, actually, um, most developers are now, uh, data scientists are now using things like TensorFlow uh, and PyTorch and Lightning and FastAI. Um, and so GPGPU is being used extremely extensively around the world now uh, through these higher level libraries uh, and nearly always via Python. Um, but um, the thing is that these libraries like PyTorch behind the scenes, they're calling compiled C libraries, such as um, for deep learning, QDNN, or the PyTorch C++ um, library, or the C, C and C++ mixed library. Um, so although the Python developer is, is working in Python, um, there's, a, there's a point at which they can't easily dig any deeper because it's jumping into compiled code. And in the case of things like QDNN, it's not even open source code. Um, so what's the issue? Well, the issue is that for Python programmers, there's things that they either can't do at all or can't do conveniently. So because um, it ends up being turned into these, um, these really very big um, C libraries or pre-compiled libraries, um, edge deployment can be very difficult. Um, for example, when you install PyTorch, you're actually installing uh, over a gigabyte um, it's an over a gigabyte download. Um, and um, trying to turn your Python code into something that you can then put onto you know, a mobile phone or a Raspberry Pi or whatever is, is incredibly challenging. Um, but from a developer experience point of view, it's actually very difficult to, to debug um, your work because you know, Python programmers are used to using the Python debugger, but most of the real work that's being done in your code is not happening in Python. Um, it's happening in these lower level libraries. Um, so trying to, to understand what's really going on is extremely challenging. Same problem for profiling. So obviously we all want our code to, to run fast. Um, and that's challenging to do um, when you can't easily just use your Python profiler to jump in and see what's going on, where are the holdups, how do I make it faster? Um, a lot of people um, think that it's not important when I speak to people. They say it's not important that Python programmers can kind of dig into the underlying kernels um, and understand them and debug them and, and customize them um, because, you know, Python programmers are happy working at these higher levels. But actually, this is a, a big challenge. Um, because realistically, if you're whether you're doing research or production in industry, um, at some point you you want to dive in and and change things. And in my experience, most of the time there's something I would like to try and change that's buried down inside one of these pre-compiled libraries. Um, also, as an educator, it's very hard for me to teach people what's going on because I can't show them the actual code that's really running behind the scenes. Um, and so for understanding the implementation details, whether it's for an educational reason or because you want to understand how the algorithm works to think about how you can improve it, um, this is either impossible or extremely 
difficult. Um, and this kind of hackability is critical for the developer experience, um, in, in my opinion. So there's various um, hacks to try and handle these deficiencies. Um, so for example, um, PyTorch now has a specialized profiler just for profiling PyTorch. Um, NVIDIA has a specialized profiler as well. These are really neat tools and it's really cool that they're being provided for free. Um, but the fact is that it's still not a great developer experience to have to learn a whole new tool which works in a different way and that's not actually giving you a consistent view of all of your code. Um, for um, edge deployment um, and uh, or even sometimes a web hosting, there are hacks like in particular tracing and a, and a just-in-time compiler that are provided by both TensorFlow and PyTorch. Um, so the idea is that you use the JIT or the tracing mechanism to basically turn your Python code um, into, you know, um, basically some, some code in a different form. Um, in particular, it's likely to be uh, ONNX, uh, which is kind of a, an open standard for, for sharing um, these kind of models. Um, the problem is that Python is a really rich and dynamic language. And so in, in either of these cases, they're not capable of um, handling all of the things that Python can do. So for example, in the case of the PyTorch just-in-time compiler, um, there's all kinds of things where it's just gonna give you an error and say, I'm sorry, I don't know how to do that. Um, more frustrating for me, I find, is that very often it does something slightly different to how Python works. And it's then very difficult to know, well, why did it work in Python? And it didn't work when I um, compiled it to ONNX. Um, another very interesting technology is XLA, uh, which comes out of Google and is now um, available as a backend for both TensorFlow and PyTorch. Uh, so this is an accelerated linear algebra compiler. Um, it's a similar kind of idea to the, to the um, PyTorch JIT, um, but it's something which is specifically designed around creating a really accelerated, um, fast version of your code. Um, and so nowadays it's used, for example, when PyTorch wants to talk to a TPU, um, it will go through the XLA compiler because that's the best way to create um, TPU code at this stage through XLA. Um, so these are all nice to have, but they, they you know, have a lot of shortcomings. It's not nearly as convenient and not nearly as good a developer experience as using just Python uh, and using the Python tools that Python programmers are familiar with. Um, another very interesting new approach um, is JAX. Um, JAX is another Google um, project and it's um, also a Python library, um, but it's actually specifically designed um, to bring Python over to XLA. So it's written from the ground up for XLA. And what's particularly interesting about JAX is that you can kind of, kind of write your own kernels. Um, so you're not as limited um, as you are with, um, with the tracing and JIT approaches. You're li still limited to doing just the stuff that your underlying C you know, or CUDA or whatever library um, has written for you, or else with JAX, um, you can do a lot more stuff. There's a lot more flexibility. And so this is very um, interesting approach, but we still have the problem that the code that's running um, on the accelerator is not the code you wrote. It's a transformation of that code through XLA. And so again, profiling it and debugging it and understanding really what's going on is difficult. Also, um, in order to provide these uh, composable transformations, um, JAX has a very, um, I mean, it's very interesting, but in some ways a very limited programming model. It's highly functional and immutable. Um, and so um, JAX you know, ends up with this kind of complexity from this functional programming model. State management becomes difficult. Things like random number generation um, becomes um, particularly challenging and obviously in, in my world of machine learning and deep learning, um, random numbers are very important as they are in many other GP, GPU areas. 
So I feel like these are all like amazing technologies, um, so much impressive work going on, but it doesn't feel like, you know, the really long-term solutions. I don't see how any of these things quite end up giving us the developer experience we'd like to be able to offer. Um, another very interesting technology I wanted to mention is TVM. Um, so TVM is an Apache project nowadays, and you can uh, use TVM directly from Python, and you basically end up creating these um, compute expressions, um, in this case, using a Lambda. Um, and if you're familiar with something like Halide, similar kind of idea, you can um, basically create a schedule, which will figure out how to, um, uh, where, you, where you can show various ways that you think it might be best um, run on an accelerator. And in this case, you're actually binding axes to uh, blocks and threads on the accelerator. Um, this is a super convenient way uh, to, to write kernels. And more importantly, perhaps it also has things like uh, auto schedulers. Um, so this is how you can create things that run as fast as QDNN or you know, specialized linear algebra libraries from NVIDIA or whatever, um, without having to write all that um, you know, um, unrolled loops and memory management and whatnot. But as you can see in the end, it's still not anywhere near as convenient as writing normal Python. And the thing you end up with is, you know, this kind of compiled code that again, has all the kind of developer experience issues I described before. Um, perhaps the most interesting path for the future for me um, right now is um, Julia. Um, Julia is a fairly new language, um, but what's really interesting for from a GPGPU standpoint is it handles nearly all of the developer experience problems I described. Not, not, not Nearly none of them exist in Julia. And the key thing is that in Julia, you can write kernels that look a lot like you would write in, in CUDA, um, but with uh, less boilerplate. Um, and you can do um, in parallelized operations, um, you can you can handle memory um, that can all be done in Julia, and so I think this is a really underappreciated, um, important uh, idea, which is that um, developers should be able to use the same language and the same tools throughout the hierarchy of abstractions in their program. Um, again, speaking as an educator, this is incredibly important for. Um, teaching people um, what's going on. It's really important for a researcher because you can hack in at any level. It's really important in industry because you can ensure that you can jump in and make sure the performance is, is, is working properly for you at every level. Um, and it also kind of, it opens up the research world in such a way that, um, Things aren't off the table. You know, I find that the things that get worked on in, in deep learning research are the things that are kind of conveniently accessible through libraries. And a lot of stuff um, that isn't has just not really been touched because it requires people to go in and write their own CUDA kernels. And very, very, very few people have the, <laughs> the patience to do that, at least in, in the deep learning world. Um, so um, yeah, really, I guess, this is a, a bit of a plea um, for the GPGPU community to, to consider, um, you know, building the next generation of, of languages and tools, um, which allows um, developers to, to really do everything that they might want to do in a, in a convenient way. Um, for Julia, I feel like there's, there's a lot of gaps in the developer experience there more generally, which I think the community is very familiar with around uh, deployment and around the amount of memory use that it requires and the amount of uh, latency it requires to start up and, and so forth. But I do think at least with Julia, it feels like something that there's a path there that could eventually lead to a really beautiful developer experience. And that's not a path that I see available in really any of the Python frameworks that I see um, right now. Um, 
and I would love to see things like um, TVM being take, you know, more integrated with those ideas into, into languages and tools. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the end of my thoughts on that. Thanks very much.